It's good to see you today. I'm looking around and I'm seeing that I'm not the only one that didn't get the memo. I woke up this morning thinking we were going to have some good fall weather. I see sweaters and vests and flannels and all that good stuff. And, and then I got outside and all of a sudden I realized somebody slipped in a little summer. Scott Prow is the only one that knew and he is the only one that dressed appropriately this morning. He knew we got robbed today. We just got robbed. Kind of, if, if, be honest, you, you know when it's the days like today when we're looking for fall, it kind of messes up that, that pumpkin spice mocha chocolate thing that you like to drink this time of year that's so gross, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. It's a great day to be at Church Alive this morning. Hey, good morning. Listen, I'm Pastor Scott. If you're new here today, I would love to get an opportunity outside of the message today to meet you, but we're just excited that you're here, and I'm excited to continue in our series, Rooted. Um, Pastor Jimmy and, of course, and Amanda, as mentioned, are not here, but we're in a season of preparation, um, and we're in a, a sermon series, if you haven't been here before, where we are focusing on spiritual disciplines. We're not waiting till January 1st to get ready and make resolutions. Actually, we as a staff and, and with Pastor Jimmy's leadership decided we were going to prepare early on. Um, spiritual discipline is not for the sake of just doing something or because our human actions alone, uh, you know, are enough, but it's the fact that we realize that we want to be rooted and we want to be strengthened in our walk with God. And we also want to learn how to be faithful and to live faithful in a broken world. And so sometimes um, in, in our lives, it gets so busy um, that we forget. And spiritual disciplines bring us back to the center of who we were made to be. And so we're just going to continue in that this morning. And so um, as we begin, I realize that you and I have a problem, um, and the problem may be bigger than you even realized. Um, it's big enough that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, have taken notice over the last several years. The problem is under the transportation safety um, heading for distracted drivers. How many of you have ever seen distracted drivers? Okay, come on, be honest. How many of you have been distracted drivers? Yes. Absolutely. As I was reading, I realized that the CDC say that nine people in the United States are killed every day in crashes that are reported to involve at least one distracted driver. It's like, really? Um, it's so serious that they've actually categorized it. There are at least three, time, three kinds of distracted drivers. Um, one is being visually distracted, which is taking your eyes off the road. Um, the second one is manual distraction, taking your hands off the wheel. Uh, some of us like to drive with our knees and our elbows and other things. Third category is called cognitive distraction, which is taking your mind off of driving. And one thing that I read that just blew me away, um, it said that the CD says that 55 miles per hour, sending or reading a text is like driving the length of a football field with your eyes closed. Can you believe that? It's serious. It's probably more serious than we realize. And so in a, in a poll they took and with statistics, they said in 2019, over 3,100 people were killed and over 400 and 24,000 people were injured due to distracted driving. How many of you know that's a problem? It's a problem. It's in that same vein that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians began talking to a church that he helped plant. The Corinthian believers were gifted. They were bright. They were the kind of people that would make up a great church. And yet, as a father in the faith, Paul began to notice a certain distraction that was going on in the church. I don't know if it started out as a mild concern, but as red flags begin to wave everywhere, Paul 
became so troubled by this that he speaks to them in the voice of, of a father giving away a bride. In the ancient world, a father would betroth his daughter, a contract would be laid out, and then he would be responsible to make sure that his daughter was ready for the wedding day because preparations could take months, even years, and Paul wanted them to be ready. So listen with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 2. Paul says, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. How many of you know the church is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ? Paul said, I'm concerned. He said, I'm jealous over you. He said, you're distracted. Your eyes are not on the prize. The wedding day is coming. It's going to be here, and you're not ready yet, and I see it, and i got to say something about it. In verse number three, he says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. Paul is saying, hey, it used to be a mild concern, but now, now I'm worried about you. I'm afraid that, that just like Eve, who had it all, who needed nothing, Listen to the voice of the serpent. Listen to the voice of the enemy. Tell her when every need imaginable was supplied abundantly, somehow she needed more to be happy. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the spiritual discipline of simplicity or living a spiritually simple life. I want to talk about being rooted in that. And, and, and what that means. You see, the truth is that there are two kingdoms today in conflict. One is the kingdom of our culture. The other is the kingdom of God. Our culture tells us that the path to peace, to happiness, to fun, to success, to the good life consists of one thing, more. More activity, more money, more friends, more power, more prestige, more material things, more clothes, more square footage, more of what is newest and latest and fastest and biggest and shiniest and trendiest and whatever is all the rage in our culture. I guess you could say it's a gospel of sorts, maybe an American gospel, I don't know. It does make many promises for many new and shiny things that will cost more than we could possibly imagine. But may I remind you that the carrot dangling in front of us is attached to a stick. We have an enemy today that wants to get our minds off of the simplicity and the focus of following Jesus. Meanwhile, Jesus offers a different path, a different way, a different gospel. Follow with me in Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28, listen to what Jesus says. He says, first of all, it's so simple. Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. How many of you could use more rest? How many of you took advantage of the extra hour? This Yes, praise God. There was something spiritual about it. But Jesus says, come to me. If you want rest, you're not going to find it out there. You're not going to find it in the millions of promises that you get every day that flash on your devices, that constantly bombard you. Jesus said it starts with coming to me. He also says in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, there it is, rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Jesus says, I'll offer you an off-ramp to the frantic, unrealistic, demanding pace that that kingdom calls us to every single day. And he says, if you come to me, it will cost you. There's a yoke if you come with me, but it's easy 
The burden of it is light compared to the cost out in the world. Jesus offered a way of simplicity to his followers and anyone that would dare to strike down the path with him. And so I want to talk about it a little bit this morning. So the first thing I I want to ask is what is spiritual simplicity? It's not really something we talk that much about. Um, It's not something you hear much about. And yet the more and more I read it, the more I convicted I was and the more I realized this is something I need more of. I need spiritual simplicity in my life. So I want to give you a couple of examples. Richard Foster is one of the fathers of spiritual disciplines, and I'll start with what he says. I want you to listen to to what Richard Foster says. He says, simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. It is the inward reality of single-hearted focus upon God and his kingdom, which results in an outward lifestyle, check this out, of modesty, openness, and unpretentiousness, and I love this part, and which disciplines our hunger for status, glamour, and luxury. Mm. Another more simple definition is this, this simplicity is intentionally getting rid of things in our lives that hinder our walk with God. Another that I like says, it's an uncrowded internal life that points in only one direction. I think that's what God intended for us. I think we've got too many choices. I think we're overwhelmed by all the demands. I think we're trying to do too much and to please too many people and to go after things in in, in the name of all the wrong things to get things that will never truly satisfy us. And Jesus says, look, if you'll just come to me, I've got something better for you. Now, anytime you talk about this, You have to clarify, and I want you to know simplicity, a simple life. It's not poverty. It's not seeing how little you can barely scrape by with and still live. That's not what I'm talking about. But it does push back against the pressures of culture, and it takes away the need to keep up with our neighbors. It leaves us happy and grateful with what we have knowing that God has taken care of us and that he's capable of supplying all of our needs. But even if he doesn't give us anything else, we will always have enough in him. You see, we know that our modern culture is all out of whack. We, we know things are unbalanced. Internally, externally, we feel it. Yet too many times we resemble culture instead of kingdom. I'm talking about believers. I'm talking about family. I'm talking about us. We know things are all wrong. You see, we buy things, you've heard this, that we don't need, that we can't afford to impress people that we really don't even like. Guilty. Listen to this. We covet things, even though we know that's a sin. We covet things, and we call it ambition. How about this? We hoard things. God forbid we ever get on on the TV show. We hoard things way more than we could ever use, and we call it wisdom or prudence. You know, I mean, you never know. There there could be another Great Depression, so we, we better get 12 popcorn poppers just so we can outlast it, right? Not only that, But we allow greed in our lives, which we know grieves the heart of God, and we call it industry. And we allow the values of the culture to dictate our lives every day. I think the truth is we're just pursuing the golden goose that we believe that we need and that we think we deserve. Meanwhile, that still small voice says, come away with me. I've got something so much better. That will never make you happy, but I'll give you peace. I'll give you joy. So Jesus taught us a new way of living, a way of peaceful and unhurried following. He called us to a way of radical contentment and trust in God. He called us to a life that was free from the need of things so that we can trust God. The question is, 
How do we stay content and keep our heads and trust radically in a culture like ours? How do you keep your head and how do you stay content when the economy is terrible, when the stock market is down, when crime is up, when everything is more expensive, when our country seems more divided than ever before? How do you do it? Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, and I'm going to be in Matthew 6 quite a bit. Again, Jesus, the master teacher who has a better way, says this, listen, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know what's intriguing about that? Jesus did not say we shouldn't pursue treasure. He wasn't shunning that, not at all. But what he said had more to do with what is our treasure and where do we find our treasure? You see, my question to you today is this, what is your greatest treasure? Answer on the inside, what is your greatest treasure? What would you protect in your life at all costs? What would you protect at all costs? And third, what do you desire to have more than anything else? What would you desire to have more than anything? Because I think if we're honest, most of us would not answer Jesus because it's where we are as a culture. And yet, anything less than Jesus is not even worthy of that. Jesus is the only thing that we can't live without. You can take away many things, but Jesus is the one thing that he's the one that demands allegiance above everything else. And the question is, where is our treasure? You see, Jesus knew our hearts. That's why he spoke in Matthew about this. He knew our hearts were fragile. He knew we were so easily influenced by everything around us and that our hearts are attracted to many things. And so he told stories, little picture windows we call parables. And one of the parables that he taught had to do with a sower that was sowing seed. And as he was sowing seed, which represents the word of God, it was falling on different grounds because the soil represents a condition of our soul or our hearts. And there was some seed that, that fell on ground that, that was only surface level and birds came in and gobbled it up. And there were some that, that went and because it didn't go very deep, it had no roots. And so, you know, it was scorched by the sun. And there was some good ground that, that, that bore good seed, but there's this one ground that has always intrigued me, and it was thorny ground. It was the kind of ground that you wouldn't notice that on the surface because it looks like the good ground. When the seed is sown and it goes deep, growth actually starts taking place. And you look and think, hey, this is great. But you see within the same soil, there are thorns that do a number on the seed and do not allow it to bear fruit. Let's, let's read about it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth so no fruit is produced. Can I tell you that Satan's number one dream for you today, if you're a believer, is this, that you would waste your life? If you're already saved, he's lost that battle. But you know what he wants next? He wants you to spend your entire time in the, on, on this earth wasting and chasing after things that don't amount to anything in the kingdom of God. He wants us to waste our lives. And so I want to talk about just briefly, quickly, if I can, three enemies. Two are mentioned in this verse. Three enemies of spiritual simplicity. 
The first one that I want to talk about, and, and admittedly, it's the toughest one to talk about, is the enemy of wealth. And before you tune me out, just understand, Jesus had so much to say about wealth that we have to talk about it. I mean, you can't even read the Gospels without running into Jesus talking about money and wealth and possessions. He did. And if Jesus is talking about something that can potentially harm me, I want to hear it. I want to listen because Jesus doesn't lie. Now, let me be clear. Wealth and discipleship are not mutually exclusive. But more often than not, it stands in the way of fully surrendering and fully following Jesus. I love what one author said. He, he, he said it like this, wealth by nature is deceitful. It's a con artist. It has a suffocating effect on the soil of my heart, choking out the life of the kingdom. It seeks to quickly take up as much space as possible in my soul so it can enslave me and make it harder to hear from, much less depend upon my one true king, Jesus Christ. And if this were not enough, wealth fuels consumerism and materialism until the acquiring, owning, protecting, and maintaining of things becomes the major focus of my life until I find something new to pursue. Jesus knew this. And in a stark warning, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, listen to what he says. No one can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus said, it's not even possible. Like, it's not, well, I'm going to try. Jesus says, you can't do it. You're either serving one or the other. I find it intriguing. Some of your translations, if you have older, it says, you cannot serve God in mammon. Mammon or money, the God of money, is the only pagan God that Jesus mentions in the New Testament and warns his followers of. Do you realize in the Greco-Roman world there were potentially thousands, tens of thousands of gods, and Jesus was so concerned about his followers falling that he only brings up one? And he says, you can't serve it. It'll body slam you and bring you to submission. And so there's this call, rather than saying, well, yeah, but I can handle it. Maybe, maybe. But is it worth forfeiting our soul if we're wrong? We gotta be careful. Jesus, is, he gives us a warning. We, we've gotta be intentional. We can't be asleep at the wheel. We can't be texting at the wheel of our lives. We gotta be aware and pay attention because Jesus says it's a warning. And it's hard to talk about wealth. Can I be honest? It's everywhere. We're living in the West. We, when we hear about it, when we hear about the rich and the Bible has quite, we tend to think it's those other people. You know, the, the 1%, the, the billionaires, you know, the people that we read about all the time. Those are the rich people. And I realize that wealth, on, on some level, you know, can, can I just say, can I just tell you what I think? I think we're the rich. I think if you compare us to the rest of the world, we're the 1%. Like it's us. I'll never forget sitting in church, reading what Jesus has to say about wealth and getting it and a light went off and I said, he's talking to me. I thought he was talking to Elon Musk. I, I, I thought he was talking to some other people. He was talking to me. And so I want to read to you just one or so verses. Listen to what Jesus says about the rich. And just, if you'll go with me there, consider the fact that maybe there might be an application, that there was one interpretation for the audience, which would have been Timothy, but there's such a strong application for you and I. Listen, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Sounds pretty scary. 
Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So what are you saying, Pastor Scott? You're saying if I'm wealthy, that doesn't mean I love God? No, no, not at all. I think we are wealthy. It's just that I think we've got to have a plan and we've got to be aware that our hearts are so easily taken in by wealth that God is calling us to simplicity and wealth often takes us down a road of complexity so that we're distracted. In 1 Timothy 6, continuing down to verse 17, the Apostle Paul gives us a blueprint. So what do we do with it? Is, is there any remedy? What do we do with this? We're wealthy. What do we do? Verse 17, listen to this. Command those who are rich in this present world, that's me, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Oh, I like that. For our enjoyment. I like it. Yes, he does. And not only that, but verse 18. Command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. That's so powerful. Notice he doesn't say, just give it all away and live a life of poverty. You won't find it. But there's some, there's some clues here. Number one, if you're wealthy, like I am, stay humble. Stay humble. Give up the idea that you're getting what you earned. God provided everything. Amen. I know sometimes when we clock in and out, we think, you know what, I'm doing pretty good because I'm willing to put in extra hours. Hogwash. We're blessed because God provided it. And not only did he provide it, but it all belongs to him. It's not my money. It's not. Not only that, but number two, make God the source of your security. Listen, if you got stocks in the stock market, you already know. I mean, you know, some of us are trying to invest for the future, but at the end of the day, my hope, have mercy, is looking bad. But you know what? The market of heaven... The economy of God is never down. He always has more than enough. And I'm talking to people that are retiring. They say, I'm scared out of my mind. Listen, I'm not there, so I want to be really super sensitive to that because I'm not there yet. But all I can tell you is it's crystal clear from the word, trust in God. He's the source. Stay humble. Make God your source. This is my favorite. Enjoy it to the glory of God. If God has blessed you, listen, you can enjoy it to the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I get joy out of giving to my kids. When I see them, I want them to enjoy it, but not for self-glory. We enjoy it for God's glory. And then the last one is, is so clear. Stay generous. Be rich in good works always willing to share. We should be some of the most sharing, generous people alive. I've got some work to do this year. I've realized I'm rich, and God did not just bless me so I can be blessed, but he's blessing me so I can enjoy it, and I can intentionally find some other people to bless them too. All right, enough about that. The second enemy of spiritual simplicity this morning, here we go, worry. Anybody ever worried? In the parable, he called it the worries of this life. And I'm not talking about an occasional concern. I'm talking about continual worry. It can make you sick. It's bad for your health. We can get so caught up in worry, and yet, do you know that when we worry, we tell the wrong story about God? You see, we don't serve a negligent God. We don't serve a stingy God. We don't serve an absent-minded God. We don't serve a God that we have to beg and plead just to give us a little crumb from his table. No. 
We serve a generous God. We serve a compassionate God. We serve a loving God. We serve a great God. Nobody, listen, no people on the face of the earth have a testimony like God's people. That every time we pray, he comes near as if he didn't have anything else to do. When we call on his name, he comes. And he says, look, I will supply your needs according to my riches. It's not on you, it's on me. He puts himself on the line. And so when we constantly worry about things, which I was so convicted, my wife and I, we were listening to, to a hero of ours in the faith, and he just called it out. He said, do you know worry is a sin? And I thought, Lord, forgive me, Jesus, please. <laughs> it is. And not only that, but worry grieves the heart of God. You know, my kids are in school, one's in college, one's in high school, but just think with me here, what would happen if my wife and I got a phone call and said, listen, we really need you to come down to the school? And so I came down to the school and my, one of my daughters was in the corner sobbing, um, inconsolable, and, and, and maybe the school counselor or an assistant principal, someone mediating, said, listen, we got a problem. Okay, well, look, what's the problem? Because we didn't have a problem this morning when we dropped her off. What's the problem? Well, the problem is she's worried that you're not going to take care of her. She's worried that maybe she won't get to eat tomorrow or that there won't be anything for next week. She's worried that you're not going to be there for her when it matters most. She's worried that you know about her problems and you don't care. Are you kidding? Do you know how that would break my heart? Do you know that what that would do to me as a father? I mean, I'm not running for father of the year, but let me tell you something. I love my kids. If I have to work five jobs to make sure that they don't have to worry about breakfast tomorrow morning, I'm willing to do it. And I don't want my kids at night wondering, I wonder if dad's going to do it again tomorrow. And yet, isn't that what we do when we constantly worry about things that are too big for us? And we forget that we serve such a big God that knows everything about us. And he knows what's coming not only down the road tomorrow, but next year and every single day of our life. He sees the situation from every conceivable angle. And he always chooses best. Makes me want to trust him more. And so Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? He keeps it simple. Don't worry. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap or store in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying... Add a single hour to your life, the resounding answer is no. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet, I tell you, Jesus talking, I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, Will he not much more clothe you of little faith? So do not worry. There it is again. It's a repetition. Do not worry. Saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. The people that don't even know God, they're frantic about these things. But he said not you. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But here's the key, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, he wants to remember who God is, what he's promised, and what he's already done. And every single day we get a reminder and a sermon when we look at the birds outside and we look at the flowers knowing we are so much more valuable to God and yet God takes care of them every single day. And if he does it for them, will he do it for us? Yes, he'll do it for us. 
So my question is, what are you worried about today? What are you worried about today? What, what is it that, that Jesus wants to take off your plate? Is there anything that holds you captive to fear today? Your greatest fears. It's nagging. It's worrying. You wake up with, up with it in the middle of the night or up early. It's the first thing you feel in your stomach when you wake up. And this is what I do because that happens to me. When I, when I face that, I ask this question, what am I not believing about God? What am I not believing about him? Am I not believing he's good? Am I not believing he has enough? Am I not believing that he loves me? I don't know what it is, but I know that God doesn't want us to worry because it kills spiritual simplicity. Moving to the third. The third enemy of spiritual simplicity I want to talk about is busyness. You see, busyness is something that we all generally know about. But like distracted driving, sometimes we don't actually realize just how serious it is. Now, I'm not talking about being truly industrious. I'm not talking about having um, a full schedule necessarily or doing a good job. I'm talking about being overcrowded. I'm talking about the hectic life, not the good life, the frantic life, the thing that pushes us beyond limits that we don't even have. You see, Jesus knew that busyness would harm us. And so he warned us about it to flee from it. First thing that I want to just share with you is this busyness can ruin our joy. It can ruin our joy. John 15, 11 says this, Jesus talking, these things I've spoken to you that, you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. When's the last time your joy was full? You were so full of joy, it was full and spilling over onto other people. What a great place to be. And Jesus wants the seed of his word to get so deep down in our hearts that we have real joy. And for some of us, it's been a really long time since we've experienced anything even remotely close to that. And you see, it's hard to have joy when you're at a constant frenzied pace all the time. We know that joy and peace and love are all fruit of the Spirit that come from the Spirit, but when we're busy sometimes, we miss it. And when I'm not overbooked, when my schedule is not overbooked, my family will tell you I'm a better listener, I'm more fully present, I'm more loving to my wife, I'm less reactionary to circumstances, I'm more positive, I make better decisions, I'm just good all around. So why do we cram our schedules with more than we can possibly handle? Not only can it ruin our joy, but busyness can rob our hearts. Luke chapter 10 and verse 41 says this, but the Lord answered her, the story of Mary and Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. You're anxious and troubled about many things. You're going after so many things. But Martha, I only called you and asked you to do one thing. And Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Interesting. Martha is in the kitchen and she's busy trying to set a table for Jesus and she misses that Jesus had already set a table for her at his feet. He'd already set a table and she couldn't see it because she was too busy. I wonder what we're missing. You see, God doesn't have a trouble communicating. It's just sometimes we can't hear him because he's always speaking. When we have no margin, we miss out on all God is doing around us. He's doing good stuff all the time. And you know, sometimes it's annoying when you meet those people and they're constantly talking about all that God is doing in their life all the time. Well, maybe they're just making it up. Or maybe they're listening. Maybe they're creating margin and saying, God, I want to hear from you today. And God says, great, that's what I've been waiting for. I got something brand new for you. I've been waiting. Not only that, but when we have no margin, we miss out on God's best for our today and our tomorrow. So what is God saying to you? 
Could he be warning you about something? Could he be giving you directions for your next season? Trust me, whatever it is, you don't want to miss it. But it won't happen with busyness. The last thing I'll say about busyness is this, and this is the one that scares me the most. Busyness can cover up the rot that is already in our soul. You know that busyness in ministry, it is so easy to substitute that for a relationship with God. When you look busy, I think people just assume, wow, he or she's really going after it, right? But sometimes there's a problem, and the easiest way to cover it up is just grab another task. Come on, let's go. Busyness does not mean that we are faithful. It does not mean that we are fruitful. And busyness does not mean that we are walking close to the Lord. It could be a symptom of something worse. But when we're so busy and the Lord has put on the check engine light of our souls, when we're too busy, we don't see it. And it costs so much when we ignore it. And so I love this verse. You've probably read it a thousand times. It's one of those I read and something new just jumped out at me, Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted over the earth. Did you see that? God basically says two things. He doesn't say try harder because that's what we want to do. Well, maybe if I grip my teeth, maybe if I'll discipline myself, maybe if I'll, I'll get it all together. And God says, no, 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 no. Just stop. Just take a pause. Just slow down. Just cease from striving. Just be still. And the second thing he says is, I want you to know me. Be still and get to know me. Spend time with me. Why? Because I'm exalted above the nations. I'm over the whole earth. I'm over it all. There's nothing that we're ever going to scare God with. We don't have needs that God gets scared over. We don't have anything that we could bring to God that God's going to say, You know, I didn't see this one coming. I don't know what I'm going to do. No, he's over it all. The question is, will we pause and take time just to get to know him? Some of the ways practically as the musicians come or prepare to come, as we've been talking about spiritual disciplines, there's so many, and I challenge you just to to get online and find some some biblical spiritual ways. I I just jotted down several because simplicity touches so many things in our life. It, It touches our schedules, our lives, our relationships, our material possessions. So I'm going to read out a few, and I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story. Thinking about practicing spiritual simplicity, a couple of ideas and ways we could just get started, maybe just one, one or two. The first one always starts with just getting along with Jesus. Just getting along with Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, I felt so hectic, and my wife and I got away to Asheville just for a couple of days, and we had some quiet time, and we had some time together, and we had, we sat under some amazing word, and we sat under some amazing worship, and I wasn't on staff there, and and I was there for a conference, and just listening and soaking it in, it was amazing, just getting away, and for you, maybe you can't do a weekend, maybe it's a day. Maybe it's not a day, maybe it's a morning where you, you get up early or you find a way to go hiking or, or just to find somewhere where you can get a little margin to get along with Jesus. You'll be so glad you did. Spiritual simplicity could be rethinking my schedule and making margin a priority every day. It could be seeking simplicity in my speech. No lying, no exaggerating, no deception. It could be rethinking the holidays How can I practice modesty and frugality this holiday season so that I don't live with a lot of regret? How can I be more generous with my time and my resources? How can I bless someone else who is truly in need? How can I stop competing with other people and start sharing more? Those are just a few things. As I close today, the question arises for me. Some of these things are pretty heavy. What do you mean doing with less? What do you you mean reordering my life? Why would we do this as as followers of Jesus? Why in the world would we even try this? 
Why would we be willing to do with less so we can bless someone else with more? Why would we alter our schedules? Why would we fast as Pastor Jimmy preached last week so well? Why would we get into the Word like Pastor Clinton told us? Why would we witness an evangelism? There's an African story about a king in a kingdom that had a problem. There was a chicken thief that was running rampant throughout the village. And so the king, in a move to uphold justice and safety, made a decree that when the chicken thief was caught, that he would be tied to a post and he would be whipped or lashed with a whip that was interwoven with sharp pieces of metal and that he would receive 10 lashes. And his back would be lacerated to teach him a lesson so it wouldn't happen again. In spite of the edict, chickens continued to disappear. The king became irritated. And so he raised the penalty to 50 lashes. Chickens continued to disappear. Finally, the king felt mocked. And so he made the penalty 75 lashes. In spite of all of this, chickens continue to be pilfered. And so finally, in his rage, the king declared before all the people that when the chicken thief is caught, he will receive 100 lashes from the whip, which was a penalty so severe that most strong men would never survive such an ordeal. Finally, a day came when the thief was caught. And to the shock and the dismay of all the kingdom, the chicken thief turned out to be the king's mother. There was pandemonium in the kingdom because everybody was wondering what would the king do. On the one hand, his king was the rule of law. It couldn't be reversed. So what would he do? Would he stop the proceedings and scorn mercy? How could a king or how could any man brutalize his own mother? And yet if he did, would he snub justice? And so the day for the penalty came, and the king was sitting on his throne, and he commanded that the chicken thief would be brought and tied up to the post. The entire kingdom was so overwhelmed with grief and shock of it all. And so then he gave the command for the person with a whip to give the chicken thief all 100 lashes. And he said, if you fail to give them all, you will do so at the peril of your own life. And then the room got silent. And the king said one more thing. Softly, he stood up from off of his throne. He took off his robe. He went down to his aged mother, whose hands were tied to the wooden post. And he took his body, and he wrapped it around her, in essence, protecting her and covering her completely. And then he turned to the executioner, and he said, Now let the beatings begin. Why would we lay our lives down? Because we have a king who saw us at our worst, who saw us as the idolatrous, lying, stealing, proud people that we are. And when the penalty of justice came down, he stepped off his throne, he traded his crown, and he was willing to take our place and die on an old rugged cross so that we could live. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, and I want you to think about what God has done. And I won't be long, but I want to ask in this room today, if there's anybody 
that you know God is real, but you have never dared to lay down your life or surrender your life and to give it to Jesus and to become one of his followers. If you've never done that, I just wonder today, while no one's looking around, if God is talking to you and you said, today, I want that to be me. I want to follow Jesus and to give him my life. Is that you? Would you put your hand up real quick so I can see it? If there's anyone in the house, you want to start your journey with God today. You want to give your life to him. Hold just for a moment. Again, with no one looking around, I want to ask you today if there's anybody that says, you know what? I need God to help me put more margin in my schedule. I want to get to a place where my walk with God is more simple and more focused and less cluttered by the things of this world. If that's you, would you just stick your hand up to heaven and let God know yes, 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 all over the room. I want to pray for us today because I believe God is doing something in this season of Rooted. It's more than a sermon series. It's more than just having something to talk about. God is deepening the roots of church alive, and he's looking for a people that are focused, that are wholeheartedly seeking after him. And you know what? It's going to cost us something, but it's so worth it because he's got better things. So, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just lay our hearts out before you. You know us. You know the truth. You know what our hearts look like. You know what our schedules, our homes, our lives, our jobs look like. And Lord, today, I know you did not come to condemn us. You came to take shame off of us. But Lord, we know that the only way that that can come off is, Lord, when we bring our hearts open to you in surrender and honesty. And so, Lord, we do. We come to you today. And Lord, we ask you that you would do something inside of us so that wealth doesn't become our master, so that worry doesn't enslave us, so that busyness doesn't kill us. Oh God, instead, Lord, would you lead us back to a whipping post? Would you lead us back to an old rugged cross where you gave your life for us because that's where it began for every single person in this room. It was at the cross. God, would you help us today to capture a fresh vision of the cross so that we can take our eyes off of this world and we can fix our eyes back on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh God, will you be our treasure today? Will you be our everything today? And Lord, we thank you because your word is true. You will provide. You will come through. You'll do what you said. And so we give it all to you today, Jesus. And God, we thank you for this service today. In Jesus' name, and somebody said? Amen. 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 God bless you today.